Thank you very welcome to this morning's meeting of the Infrastructure Committee. Um, we have a quorum and just um, welcome all members to the session. Um, we have a hybrid session again this morning where a number of members are coming through to the meeting via the Starleaf. Um, today we will consider a departmental briefing on subordinate legislation in relation to the A1 upgrade and also to the Balna Hinch bypass scheme. And we'll also receive a briefing from the Department on Living with Water in Belfast. Um, could I just uh, remind members, just with regards to um, those who are coming via Starleaf, perhaps to um, mute your mics, um, just to avoid um, interference, and also to raise your hands um, if you wish to, to speak at any point um, throughout the agenda. Um, just to remind everyone that we do need to vacate this room at 12pm at, um, at the very latest, so just if you can keep that in mind as we're going through um, the agenda. Moving then to apologies, the only apology that I have received is from Dolores Kelly, um, I know that she has a, another engagement, although I think she had hoped maybe to join us at some stage, particularly in relation to the discussion on the A1, so if she can do that, I, I've I believe that she will try to. Um, moving then to um, chairperson's business, um, members um, will be alert to um, newspaper reports last week just in relation to the Court of Appeal decision regarding the issue of um, road maintenance contracts. Um, and if members are content, that may be something that we wish to, to raise directly with the department, um, particularly around the rationale for appealing. But on a broader basis, given the issues in relation to the issuing of other contracts around um, four council areas, that if members agree that we could have a briefing and request a briefing with regards to procurement in its sort of broader nature as well, members are content. Yeah. Uh, anyone else wish to yeah. make a comment with regard to that? Are you content? Okay. Moving then to draft minutes at page six. Um, it's the meeting of the 21st of April. Um, are members content? Great. Great. Okay. Moving then to matters arising at page 15. Again, that's from the meeting of the 21st of April. Do members have any issues which they wish to raise? Anyone wish to raise any issues with regards to our matters arising? No, everyone's quiet. Okay, thank you. Um, at page 18, we have outstanding committee requests um, for information, and obviously, um, various reminders have been sent over the, over the last few weeks um, to prompt departments and others into responding. Moving then to correspondence, just draw your attention to the correspondence memo at page 26. Um, Quite a number of um, the correspondence items actually are in relation to our inquiry, which we will return to in the next couple of weeks. Members, any other comments to make with regards or issues they wish to raise from correspondence? No. Nope. No, you're content to note the, the memo. Okay, the actions, thank you. Moving then through to item six. We're getting through this very well. Thank you, members. Um, okay. um, Mr. Boylan. Sorry, just just on, on another matter. Sorry, I was just waving my hand there, trying to raise my hand. Chair, today is Workers Memorial Day, and I'm wondering, um, were you thinking of considering doing a minute science at eleven o'clock? Did anybody approach that subject? No. No. No, no, we are. Mm. Would there be any support in committee for that, Chair? I would wish to support having a um, minute seven at one o'clock or eleven o'clock as well. Yeah. Okay, members content. Okay, Mr. Boy, Mr. Beggs, did you have something additional to say? Thank you, Chair. Oh, okay. That's okay. Thank you. Then moving on to um, item six, which is SL one. Um, Trunk Road T4 Lock Brickland to Hillsborough, A1 Junctions Phase 2, Order Northern Ireland 2021. Uh, you'll find information in respect to that at page 70. And at page 74, the departmental <coughs> briefing. At page 77, the SL1, the private accesses on the Trunk Road T4, the A1 Junctions Phase 2 Lock Brickland to Hillsborough, 
Stopping Up Order Northern Ireland 2021. And if I can just welcome to um, the committee via Starleaf, uh, Mr John Irvine, the Director of Major Projects and Procurement, um, David Miller, the Head of Lands, and Liam McAvoy, um, Southern Division Strategic Road Improvement Manager. We can just um, bring the witnesses into focus. Um, and I just ask, John, would you like to, to lead on this? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah, good. Uh, so, um, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, th this is part of a process to enable the committee uh, to consider the SL1s and uh, approve the making of the order. So, in relation to the A1, uh, the Minister announced her decision to proceed with the scheme following the inquiry at, at the end of January and has asked officials uh, to make the orders. Um, maybe the, 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 the Davy Miller will say something about the orders and then uh, Liam McAvoy has got a short presentation and then perhaps after that we, we can take questions. So maybe Davy, do you just want to say something about the orders? Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Thanks. Yep. Okay, so the, the, the orders for the A1 scheme is the trunk road order, or we commonly known as the direction order, and there's a stopping up of private accesses order. The purpose of the trunk road order is threefold. One is to identify uh, uh, the areas or lengths of road that need to be upgraded to trunk road status uh, in the scheme. It also serves then, once it's made, the line of the scheme through the planning process. It also is our formal approval, our legal approval to, uh, to proceed with the scheme. Private accesses uh, order, um, that's the order uh, that we, is necessary to stop private accesses. They're not uh, within the footprint of the vesting order. So these are private accesses that are just outside the vesting order line. Uh, just at the end of it, uh, side roads, which these are access are just too close to the new proposed road and need either closed off, alternative uh, provisions provided. So then that's the basis of the two orders. Okay. So maybe Liam, if you would like to uh, give the short presentation on the scheme to the committee. Can't hear Liam. Liam, we can't hear you. Still can't hear Liam. No. Apologies. Yeah, that's you. me on mute. On muted now. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, Phew. Uh, apologies. Um, right. Okay. I'm going to try and share this screen here to see if I, if I can um, um, uh, get the presentation. I know people have got the, the, the presentation in front of them, but I, I'm just going to um, see if I can get this up. And uh, uh, can you can people see that um, screen now? No, we can't. We'll just work on. This. I think we'll maybe just work on what we have. If you're if you're content with that. Um. Okay. Uh, oh, that's it now. That's grand. You can see that now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, right. Um, as John was saying, the purpose of this scheme is to improve road safety along a 25 kilometre stretch of the A1 between Loch Brickland and Hillsborough Road Roundabout. Um, the I'm going to present the main elements of the scheme on the map basis as shown from Loch Brickland in the top left hand corner um, to Hillsborough in the bottom right hand corner. But before I do that, I'm just going to maybe show for people the geographic context um, of where we are. So everyone will appreciate that the A1 sits along the, the eastern seaboard corridor of the, um, the key transport corridor um, like in Larn to the border at Newry. Um, the circle in red highlights the extents of the scheme that form part of this project. Now, that section, 25 kilometre section, 
uh, of the A1 has been designed and constructed to much older highway standards and as such is presenting, you know, it has characteristics that would be no longer desirable and is presenting safety issues. Um, in particular, there's over 100 gaps in the central reserve along this 25 kilometre stretch. And those gaps in the central reserve at the moment, traffic can turn, currently turn right or make U-turns and conflict with other mainline traffic along there. Um, and it's the presence of these gaps that presents a high number and severity of accidents along the stretch of the A1. So this project will aim to close up all of those gaps in the central reserve between Hillsborough and Loch Brickland. Um, the safer alternative to traffic crossing at um, gaps in the central reserve is to provide grade separated junctions. Um, at present, there are eight grade separated junctions currently provided along this stretch of the road. Um, here is an example of the, the Pantridge link close to um, Hillsborough, which provides an overbridge to allow traffic to safely cross um, the A1 rather than crossing through a gap in the Central Reserve. Um, this project is aiming to provide four more new compact grade separated junctions, um, the yellow dots on this screen. Um, three of those will be provided between Banbridge and Dremore, and a fourth will be provided north of Dremore. Um, the proposed compact grade separation junctions will be um, similar in format to the existing Pantridge link at Hillsborough, um, where uh, the, the safe crossing of the carriageway will be provided by an overbridge, as shown in the, in the little simulation picture um, graphic in, on the screen. In addition to that, um, we will be uh, also providing uh, a new um, link to an existing um, underpass at um, north of Dromore um, to link the Milebush Road into it. Um, these, in addition to that, uh, we will also be uh, providing a new onslaught at Banbridge to facilitate uh, a large and high demand for traffic, northbound traffic wanting to uh, access the A1 at this location. Um, so in terms of the remaining uh, junctions, uh, the minor, where possible, we will be linking in minor roads to those new group compact grade separated junctions. Um, and there are six minor roads that we will link into those. Um, 21 of the remaining minor roads will then be re reconfigured to operate um, as left in, left out only. So they won't permit traffic to turn right out of them and cross the dual carriageway. There'll be traffic will have to um, merge left onto uh, the carriageway and make a U-turn at the new grade separated junctions if they want to head in the opposite direction. Now, these left in, left out arrangements, will all of them will provide a diverge lane, which will allow traffic to exiting the A1 to safely decelerate off the main line. And where possible, at 15 of these 21 locations, we will also provide a merge lane. There are five locations where, due to physical constraints, we can't provide a merge lane, but where possible, we're aiming to do that at 15 of them. Um, in addition, at the new grade, compact grade separated junctions, um, we're providing new bus stops. Currently, there are 37 bus stops along the A1 between Loch Brickland and Hillsborough. And at present, buses essentially just have to, there's no laybys provided, buses just have to slow down in the hard shoulder um, and pedestrians are crossing the road to get the bus stops on the other side. So safer arrangements uh, is proposed to remove those 37 bus stops from the main line and provide four new bus stop facilities each to new compact rates every junction. Um, and 
the final element of the, of the scheme then um, will be to close up nine um, uh, of the remaining uh, minor roads, and those nine locations are highlighted by the red axis on the screen. Um, so once we have those improvements in place, that will allow us to close up all of the hundred and more gaps in the central reserve and to implement a, a continuous central reserve safety barrier along the entire 25 kilometre length from Hillsborough roundabout to Loch Brickland. Um, so in, in summary, the main features that we're talking about before the scheme, we have got eight compact grade separated junctions after the scheme. We will have 12 compact grade separated junctions. Um, minor roads that can currently cross the, the A1 at grade, there are currently 36. After the scheme is implemented, there will be none. Six of these minor roads will be incorporated into the new grade separated junctions. 21 will operate as left in left out only, and nine will be closed. Currently, there are over 174 private and agricultural accesses along um, the extents of the scheme. After implementation, we will be closing up almost 50 of those, so there'll be 127, and those will operate as left in, left out only. And at, at present, there are over 100 gaps in the central reserve, and when the scheme is implemented, there will be none. So, in summary, that's um, that's an overview of of the main elements of the scheme, which are which aim to improve to deliver these safety improvements along the stretch of the road. Thank you. Thank you, John. So uh, maybe pause there, and if, if, if members have any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and obviously this is a scheme which has um, been called for for a very long time and has, has very broad support, particularly from the aspects of, of a, a, a safety perspective. Can I just ask about the funding for the scheme, um, the cost of it, and you know, obviously how, um, if funding were to become available, how um, work would then be, be approached? Um, will it be got done in a phase um, process? So maybe I'll, I'll lead in that name if you want to come in. So, um, okay. uh, the, so the Minister has indicated that she's committed to deliver the scheme subject to funding being available. So once we get to the end of what we call the development phase, which is when the orders are made and we finish the economic uh, the business case for it and that's approved which is a, approximately six months from now the scheme becomes procurement ready uh, and then it, it's it's where it sits in the time frames after that so uh, it, we reckon it's probably uh, 18 months uh, from that point uh, uh, to procure and probably um, three years to build after that so the, the cost estimate 65 to 75 million uh, 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 and essentially then uh, uh, you know with, with discussions with the, the minister and you know sitting alongside her other priorities um, we'll have to determine uh, how, how it proceeds as one or in sections and I'll start to that Liam yeah um, in terms of just the point about phase in the works there is scope to deliver the scheme in a phase manner um, there are certain sections that could be prioritised and delivered as discrete sections of work, and the advantage of that would be that there would be um, smaller funding requirements to deliver that. So, um, given the pressure on 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 um, public funds, that may be an option for us. The 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 offside to that is that the overall delivery of the scheme would take longer than the three years that it would be if we were to deliver it as a single package. Although I suppose the upside to that would be at least there would be some progress rather than waiting for 65, a lump sum of 65 to 75 million, which could then delay it even longer. Yeah, those are the considerations that we would you know, would have to be given along those lines. You know, ideally the priority, I suppose, would be if money was no object, we could, you know, deliver all of the improvements as quickly as possible. But you know, that's, that's a matter of funding availability, obviously. Okay, 
and, and just in relation then to um, the objections, and, and I note that there were seven and, and two have been withdrawn, and they are primarily with regard to stopping up and obviously access to um, from road to the la to land and so on. Um, could I just ask about the ongoing engagement um, with the landowners and those who have objected and how that's progressing? Yes, John, do you want me to fill that yeah, again? You take that one then, David, if you want to come in. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the objections, uh, in overall terms, there were, there were 14 objections to both the direction order and the stopping up order. As you have said there, there were seven uh, objections specifically to the stopping up order. And two of those were withdrawn um, uh, in advance of the public inquiry following our engagement. The remaining five to the stopping up order all relate to one private access. And I'm not quite sure if we go into the detail of that, but they relate to the one private access, but they're not um, the landowner that is actually provided for for the access, their neighbours to them. So we will continue to um, the, to engage with those people to um, to see if we can get satisfactory arrangements. The inspector has made recommendations in terms of those, and the the, the department has accepted those recommendations. Um, and one uh, part of that recommendation is that there will be ongoing consultation with um, landowners to minimise. Um, the impact on where possible and where our policies and guidance uh, allow us to do so. Okay. And, and have there been lessons learned from other schemes? Just in relation mm. to consultation and so on and, and, and delivery, I'm thinking of maybe A26, for example, too. As, as part of our, our normal strategic road improvement scheme, um, we do share lessons from other schemes uh, through our uh, um, headquarters. They collate uh, lessons learned from other schemes and they do disseminate it to each of the divisional schemes. So yes, absolutely, there are lessons learned. In fact, yesterday we had a lesson learned workshop on this particular project um, so that we could gather any um, findings from how we, we've undertaken our consultation to date and, and got through the, the public inquiry process. But yes, as we advance through the procurement process, we will be looking to other recently procured and um, projects to see um, if, there's, if there's anything that we can learn from those in terms of, of taking the project through the next stages. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Buchanan? Okay, thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks, gentlemen, for your briefing so far. I have a couple of just quick questions. With respect to the uh, 50 or approximately 50 private and agricultural accesses, do you see a, a large number of slow moving, primarily uh, agricultural vehicles, going onto the road for longer distances because of those you know, places being closed up so to travel further? Do you see that as an issue? Um, that, that is um, one of the issues that has been considered as part of this scheme. Um, at present, there are lots of um, slow moving and long vehicles. Uh, turning right across at, uh, across the central reserve at relatively narrow um, uh, gaps in the central reserve. And at present, there are locations where you've got slow moving vehicles in the overtaken lane or in the fast lane, slowing down to very slow speed to negotiate those as they wait for gaps in the opposing traffic. There, will, there are times when those slow moving vehicles overhang the gap in the central reserve into um, the, the, the carriageway. Um, and, you know, so there is a balance between, between um, the, the, the relative risk of each of those maneuvers. Um, where possible, we have um, uh, engaged with landowners to provide accommodation lanes to some of the great separated junctions, and we have been it has been possible to um, provide arrangement for some landowners who have got um, lands on both sides of the road um, to uh, allow them to move a large proportion of their um, traffic movements off the carriageway completely. However, that's not the case in all in in, in all circumstances, and there will inevitably be um, additional. 
uh, movement along the carriageway, but that is generally considered to be safer than crossing the carriageway and conflicting with opposing traffic, which, you know, at some sections along here, there's there's 40,000 vehicles per day that it would, that conflict would be. But in general, it is considered safer to be moving with traffic um, than, than crossing it. Okay, and then just one, one final point on, on the bus stops. Uh, I think you're going to four, you said. I, I missed the how many you were reducing by. What capacity are you leaving at those new bus stop locations for park and ride? You know, what's, you know what car parking facility, considering the, the massive reduction in bus stops down to four? At the moment, there, there's 37 bus stops along the main line, and those are generally just used by local service buses. They're not used by the gold liner services, so they're not used by the large interurban services. Okay. They're generally only used by local services, and each of those bus stops are very lightly used based on our consultations with TransLink. Some of them see very little use um, any day, maybe one, two users. So in general, the bus stops that we're providing at the new um, grade separated junctions are to replace those um, facilities and they are to um, to be used by local service buses. So TransLink have indicated that their interurban buses still won't be using these. They will continue to use their existing facilities. So it's, these aren't proposed as uh, interurban park and share. Um, or park and ride sites, they're proposed just as um, a safer arrangement for local people to access local bus services. Um, so they're relatively modest and the parking spaces that are provided at them are essentially for, for drop-off parking rather than um, park and ride. So there's going to be no all-day parking facility there? Or is there spaces for cars to park? There will be probably between five or six Places at each of them to park, but in general, it wouldn't be for for um, all day parking. Um, that wouldn't be the aim of them. Okay, and last and the, 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 the services wouldn't the, the bus services that would serve these wouldn't generally be conducive to that nature of, of commuter and um, all day parking. And just one quick question on the parking. Is there plan to be cameras on that? I know, I know there only is space for five or six cars, as you refer to. Is there going to be cameras there for security? Uh, uh, I would need to sort of check that. At, at the moment, that, that element of detail will probably be worked up at, at a later stage. We, we have proposals to introduce ITS at various locations along uh, as part of the improvements. Um, uh, the issue of, of uh, CCTV at the bus stops to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I can, I can check that for you. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Gimmins? Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to Davy and, and John this morning. I suppose um, I very much welcome the progress that's been made on this scheme, and I just want to even take this opportunity to uh, pay a tribute to Monica Heaney, um, who, you know, following the death of her, Carl on the, her, her son, Carl, on the A1 in 2018, um, you know, she has had a massive campaign, and I think it has played no small part in getting to this stage today. Um, and, and sadly, their family was touched by another road death at the weekend. So um, I think that, that has emphasised the need to get this progressed as quickly as we can. John, you had mentioned there, and I know you, you will be aware, I, we have made calls before to try and get this um, up and running as quickly as possible. And you'd outlined there around the, the, tw the two years approximately before um, work would start. And then you said about three years. So can I just clarify, that being three years for the work, the actual building work to be completed? Yeah, so if the scheme was delivered all in one go, it's probably three years to, to, you know, to construct it. Okay, no, that's grand. I thought, so we're talking approximately five years in total then before we would see the, the, everything completed, is that right? Yes, approximately from from the point where a, a, a commitment was made to, to proceed with the scheme uh, and funding was available. Okay. And at what stage within that process do you think, John, that, that funding, you know, we would be looking at securing the funding? We any so, idea? Well, I, I think we're, we're coming to the point, you know, I said, once the orders are made, and uh, we've we've completed the business case process through the Department of Finance, which is likely to be September, Liam. 
then right. th there is a, a a conversation to be had. Then uh, and we'll have to you know sit down and engage with the minister, and the minister will have to then consider her priorities going forward. Okay, no, thank you. Um, the last time I suppose you were in and we were talking about the other one, I mentioned um, you know, there was further safety improvements mentioned to the road, and, and you talked about the eastern division. We're looking at the spruce field, the Hillsborough section. Um, and that south of Flock Brickland was would also be looked at as part of the regional transport plan. I was just wondering, was yeah. there any updated developments on any of that? So, uh, it, so we've been having uh, within the department, uh, uh, we've been having early conversations about the, the Spruce Field to um, Hillsborough roundabout section. So, so, so that's being considered at the moment. Uh, and then, in terms of uh, south of Loch Brickland, so we we anticipate. The RSTN transport plan comes out at the end of uh, this year for consultation and the consideration of you know, whether you would, I suppose, take the concept uh, that we're, we've presented here this morning and, and deliver something similar on that section, we'll, we'll come into play then. Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you. I suppose just as a final comment, I think you know, it, is, it is great that we've got to this stage um, and I suppose when you look at the, the history of, of the accidents, a, a large part of them occur at the gaps in, in the centre reservation. So the fact that they're all going to be closed up, I think, is, is really good. But um, thanks very much for the update this morning, for the presentation. And, and hopefully there will be no unnecessary delays. We really want to see this happening and, and get it completed as quickly as possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks for the update. And um, I think you, you obviously know that across, even across the parties, there is overwhelming support for this. Um, it's a safety issue and, and it needs done. I was trying to listen to your response to Chair and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't really getting uh, what you meant with regards to funding. Um, I absolutely understand, of course, that you would like the package complete in its totality. Um, and I'm just thinking of what we are having to do in Derry around the A2 around trying to decouple, say, for instance, one part of it for um, a part of the work that needs done in Fort George. And therefore, what the chair is saying of having to do it in sections uh, for safety reasons for development. But given that this project um, is very much linked to funding the EU uh, funding, as far as I understand it, that it's partly funded by the EU Connecting European Facility. And we know that the British government hasn't yet uh, come forward with the shared prosperity fund of you know, closing that gap. So has there been any, um, any relationship and communication with yourselves and officials in, in the Irish government? Um, you know, the Shared Ireland unit, for instance, has their approaches been made of trying to see where you can get funding elsewhere and have you used um, any indications from Whitehall? Because we know it's not from the finance minister. He's waiting for the same in relation to the Shared Prosperity Fund as to how the EU funding gap would be filled. So... Maybe just on the development of the scheme, Liam, could you just deal with the EU element of that? Yeah, well, the funding that we have been provided um, through the EU um, has only been for development costs. So we have been funded with um, of up to 50% of, of development costs through the EU Connecting um, Europe facility. Um, uh, there, there, we have no uh, grant agreement for uh, that extended beyond that to construction and that was purely on the basis of the application that the, the funding call at that stage was for a, a defined um, a, a defined time horizon which just extended to cover the, the development costs. Uh, and in terms just of, of engagement, you know, uh, you know that, that, that's for as officials uh, we're you know, charged with delivering the scheme. The kind of engagement with shared Ireland fund is, you know, at political ministerial level. Um, so um, we, we wouldn't be directly involved in that. Um, John, can I ask uh, through the chair just on a wider point? Um, I, I take what's been said uh, with regards to the development cost being fifty percent of the connecting European facility, but have you assessed what impact? 
the loss of EU funding, such as the Connecting European facility will have um, in, uh, in the department, in particular the work that you do, in a general sense? So, uh, you know, that, that might be one we, we could be better to come back to you on with, through our finance colleagues. Um, it would be certainly something maybe, maybe the finance side of our department would, would know more about than, than we would. But if that would be OK, we could come back to you on that one. OK, OK. Thank you. That's it. OK, thank you, Mrs Kelly. Well, that's it. Thanks very much, Chair, and thanks very much for the presentation. Um, the, the number of uh, serious accidents and fatalities on this stretch of road have been a concern for a very long time, and I want to join with Liz and pay tribute to the Heaney family and to many others who have uh, uh, been calling for improvements along the stretch of the road for a very long time. Are there any comparable um, stretches of road with such a, a accident history and poor outcome? Uh, for, for users. And could I ask, um, the, the, the briefing that we received talked about the notice of motion or notice of making of this direction order in March 2021. So are we a bit behind time? Um, what is the new time scale uh, for all of this? I know I heard about six months' time. I know about the subject of funding, and I think Martina made those points uh, very well about the loss of the EU funding potentially. But I just wonder. Now, this is something people have been craving for and begging for for a very long time, but it's looking like now. Maybe, Davy, you, you could just talk about the, the, the dates, but, but essentially, you, to get to the point uh, where you've got the legal authority to build the road, you have to go through the statutory processes, and, and we're now coming to the end of the statutory processes. If you like, David, do you want to add to that? Yeah, sorry, and apologies. I think it was just a table in the SL1 because obviously we can't make the direction order until it goes through the process of the committee. Uh, so that should have read May 21 because we're okay. anticipating making it in May 21 subject to uh, the wishes come through the committee. No, that, that's just that clarity I wanted, just to wonder uh, what, what, what that meant. Uh, Chair, the, uh, in terms of... Uh, other areas with such accident history uh, in terms of that uh, awful lake table, where would this road sit in your estimation? So, so that's that's probably a hard question to answer. Uh, we, 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 you know, so our um, our people in divisions would be monitoring collision histories on on roads and trying to bring forward uh, schemes to improve road safety. Uh, now, this is a large road safety scheme, if you like, but there are lots of other local transport and safety measures um, that, that, that look at accident histories and, and bring in and, you know, measures to, uh, to mitigate uh, and, and uh, improve the road network. So in terms of uh, you know, where, where this sits, uh, 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 it's probably hard for me to say. Uh, there used to be a program uh, uh, called the European Road Assessment Program that actually looked at accident rates, accident rates per billion vehicle kilometres on the strategic network, uh, which gave an idea of um, uh, you know where the uh, accident rates were highest. Um, I'm not sure actually whether that uh, is still uh, carried out anymore. It's maybe something that that you know we could come back to you if. Uh, with a bit of thought uh, and see whether uh, um, uh, we could give you some information on that. Liam, if you have anything else you could add to that? There, there was some uh, discussion at the, the public inquiry around that um, issue, particularly in terms of the numbers of accidents along this stretch of road and how they compared with others. Now, there was a little bit of analysis done at that stage. Um, uh, and again, those those will be have been reported through the public inquiry process. I wouldn't have those to hand, but we will be able to get that information for you. Well, thanks very much, Chair. Sure. I was just uh, curious about that, you know, because it is a very high accident history on you know a, a continuum in terms of that stretch of road. Um, so thank you very much, and thanks for all your work you've done uh, so far on this road. And I I, I hope to see uh, the improvement made sooner rather than later. But thank you, and Chair. I, I actually have to attend another meeting now, so my apologies for having to pop out. Thank thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muir. <coughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you for the officials for, for joining us this morning. Uh, just, just two questions. One, um, when the presentation was delivered, it outlined there was a number of um, situations where there was an inability to be able to deploy merge lanes um, because of land restrictions, and just maybe to get a, an understanding of what work was done to try to explore acquiring land to allow those merge lanes to be constructed, because uh, trying to merge on to uh, a very fast flow and to a carriageway at 60 or 70 miles an hour can be a real challenge. And the other question is really, I'm aware that over many years there's been a project in gestation then to join the A1 with the M1 at the Hillsborough Road roundabout, and just whereabouts that is at the moment. So. Can I take the second one first and then Liam? Um, so the A1, uh, M1 link uh, at, uh, at Sprucefield would, would be something again that will be considered as part of the RSTN transport plan. So, so you're right, that, that's been, uh, it, it was probably in the, the last regional strategic network transport plan. Uh, and uh, I, I think some very preliminary work was done, but it wasn't really uh, advanced very far. So that will come back into consideration with this new transport plan that's coming out for consultation towards the end of this year. Okay. Liam, on the land issue? Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so in terms of the, the locations where we are not proposing merges at those left in, left out, um, the physical constraints that are um, at those locations aren't necessarily land issues. Yeah. Um, in effect, it's to do with um, the presence of a, a downstream um, access or minor road. So in effect, uh, if we were to, to provide a merge lane um, within one kilometer of that merge lane, we couldn't have another opportunity for people who want to uh, leave the carriageway. So at the five locations where we haven't been able to provide, it's because there's either a, a, a minor road where traffic is then um, want to leave or another either residence or commercial business within five kilometer or within one kilometer um, of that merge lane, which meant that we couldn't have accelerating traffic being provided where, where there would also be a location where there would also be decelerating traffic creating um, an additional conflict at that location. So it's not a land issue, it's it's a, a safety issue and proximity issue between um, uh, other uh, uh, egresses from, from, the, from the A1. Uh, thank you very much. J just one thing, um, along the um, A1 in various sections, there is a 60 miles an hour restriction on the dual carriageway and that was put in for a very good reason. Um, when this whole scheme is finally delivered, and the sooner the better, really, will that be reviewed, or what will be the situation in relation to that? Yeah, sure. um, if you want me to take that, John. I go ahead, Liam. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, that the, the issue with those sixty men that has been raised to us on a couple um, of occasions through the through our consultation processes. Um, short answer is yes. There would be intention to review it after the scheme is in place. Um, they're, they're from through the consultation feedback, there seems to be a school of thought that the, the 60s should be extended everywhere, and there's an, a separate school of thought that um, all, all of the 60s should be removed and it should go to 70. Um, but again, at this moment in time, um, uh, we're not considering that the the um, the review of those as part of this scheme. But after the scheme is implemented, then um, it's suggested that our view would be implemented at that stage. Yeah, I just, I just think uh, obviously that'll have to be reviewed. But the main thing is to get the scheme delivered because the amount of people who have been killed and seriously injured on the stretch of the road is a, a real, real concern. Um, and getting the scheme delivered uh, as soon as possible must must be the priority. So I do appreciate the work you're doing in relation to this. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thank you. Mr. Beggs? <clears throat> Hello, uh, again, thanks uh, for your update. Um, and I need the work of Rose Engineers in getting the scheme so, so advanced at this stage. Um, 
I think it, it clearly is unacceptable to have a stretch of road with so many serious ongoing road accidents affecting people's lives. Um, certainly, as someone who, who uh, visits friends and family in that part of the world occasionally, I, I would recognise uh, concern about tra- crossing uh, across that road uh, at, at many points, and uh, it is vital that improvement does occur. Um, I noticed that uh, in the response to the Commissioner's report, the Department has accepted many of the recommendations, and that has included uh, some additional lanes to facilitate uh, uh, access to, to, to those who will be adversely affected um, in terms of their, their local local travel. Um, so my question is, having, having done that, do you foresee the need for compulsory purchase to be considerably reduced? Uh, we're, we're, uh, in terms of our consideration, our, our consideration of the inspectors' recommendations, I don't recall any where um, we would foresee the the vest the land that we have identified to be vested. Um, has been reduced. I'm, I'm not aware of, 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 of any sort of proposals to, to reduce the, the, the portion of vested land as a result of our, our considerations of these recommendations. No, no, my question is, having, having uh, taken on board a lot of uh, concerns of, of residents and landowners and made it adaptations, some of them following the recommendations of the inspector's report, uh, do you foresee land acquisition, acquisition being uh, a much simpler and what time frame do you do you see being able to uh, acquire the necessary land because it will not be possible to proceed uh, with the improvements until you have that control of the land yeah maybe maybe if i just went there uh, the, we, we only make the vesting order when we've got the funding for the scheme because the vesting order accrues the compensation to the landowners as soon as the funding becomes the for the scheme, then that's the point where we can make the best in order. That's the point when the landowners can then um, apply for their 90% upfront compensation payment. Uh, and that's a benefit to the department because we want to pay out as much as that's possible. But the, you know, the land is still required for the scheme, whether it's done in a friendly way or compulsory, it's still required. Uh, so the, the, the investing isn't changing, but we're still negotiating with the landowners and accommodation works and all of that right up to the point where the you know, construction starts. I, I appreciate that the, the, uh, the final decisions on vesting from individuals, whether to accept offers or not, will not, not occur until the offers are made, etc. But I, I would conve- commend you and, and other engineers who worked on the scheme by taking on board many local concerns, um, which I would hope will uh, make a smoother process going forward. And, and I hope that the scheme will be able to be delivered as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for the, for the presentation and John and the team. Obviously, um, I welcome the progression on day one. This is a shocking, dangerous road and there's been many accidents on it. But, but John, just, just in relation to the statutory process and the completion date, I mean, what exactly is the time frames on? Could you outline some of the challenges you may face? Because I mean, clearly a lot of people out there think this project should have been completed yesterday, to be honest. So just just your views on that and the challenges that lies ahead. So um, just just on the statutory processes, uh, um, uh, I, 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 maybe Davy, it might be good if you went back a wee bit you know, the publication of the draft orders and, and the inquiry, just to explain that to the committee, and then we'll look forward. Yeah, so um, all, all our, uh, our major work schemes are considered permitted development. They're considered permitted development because we go through that process when there's a planning application and that we consult with the public. We have a public inquiry by an independent inspector. We provide a report to the department, which is considered. We prepare an environmental impact assessment for this scheme, which is, uh, which is reviewed um, 
and uh, confirmed to us by uh, independent uh, experts. Um, that's the, that's, the, that's the statutory process for each for each game. We have to prepare an environmental impact assessment report. We have to prepare a direction order to protect the line of the scheme, identify the line of the scheme. We have to prepare a testing order to best the land necessary for the scheme. Um, and in this case, we have to prepare to uh, pro progress uh, a scoping up a private accesses order to some of those private accesses that are outside the testing line for the scheme. And all those go through the public inquiry process, the inspector makes his recommendations. We consider those recommendations, and in this case, we have accepted all those recommendations. And then the next stage of the scheme is once the orders are made, uh, is to get the funding for the scheme to make the best in order, and then award the contract and get the scheme on the ground. No, I appreciate that. I, the, 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 I asked the question in the context of you've done all the A's and crossed all the T's. We hope that there's going to be no delays. I mean, I know that all the processes have followed, it, and hopefully they have been outlined and dealt with. As part of the processes, but but over John then to the completion and the time frame because obviously yeah. we've seen major delays on, on road projects like this before. So so once the statutory processes are completed and the economic uh, case has been approved, it's 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 essentially ready to move to procurement, and then it becomes an issue of where it slots in in a forward program, um, and that you know uh, relates to you know, future budget settlements and funding being available. So you said to my colleague earlier on, because I missed part of the presentation, sorry, the system went off. I, I was saying, what time frame, what year are we looking at here for completion date, John? So, so, so from a, a positive decision to move to procurement, uh, it's probably 18 months to two years to procure, and then it, it, we reckon it's probably three years to build the whole scheme. Okay, and just one other question, and I'll give this to Liam. Liam, can you just expand a wee bit on the CCTV stuff and uh, that additional stuff that was mentioned and massive sign across the, the 25, 25K? Yeah, um, as, as part, part of the, the process, we will work with uh, um, our IT colleagues to, to consider implementation of appropriate um, uh, IT solutions along a those will be defined um, as we work up uh, the, the, the finer detail uh, um, as we, we start preparing contract documents. Um, there will be locations where we're wanting to um, implement CCTV um, and variable message signing along there to, um, to, to manage the, 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 the flow of, of traffic and to manage any adverse incidents that, that would be um, that, that may occur in, in the future. So whenever we have the new compact rate separated junctions, those will be alternative locations where um, incident management teams could perhaps uh, funnel people either on and off. And the ones will work with colleagues to, to manage those incidents to, to see where, where's the most appropriate um, location for, for those CCTV. Um, but those will be worked up um, as we go through the, the contract documentation process. You don't foresee any major issues with that at all, Liam, do you? No, um, the, the, at this stage, um, the, the main sort of location wouldn't be to have enough um, uh, land within the, the, the footprint, of the vesting footprint to allow us to put gantries in and those things. But in general, um, given that we're um, uh, working on, on an existing carriageway, the issue of, of access to land for those things, we're not envisaging any problems in that. Listen, no, thanks very much, like I say, for the presentation, John, the team, and I mean, they will be welcome. The, these works are needed, and it's, and it's very welcome. It's just, we're, I just wanted to ask in the context of, we don't want any more delays. We want to try and get this project completed as quick as possible. But thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, um, thank you. Um, Thank you to John, David and Liam for this um, and for the update. Um, are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, officials will remain for the next briefing, but I'm conscious of the suggestion which Mr Boylan made with regards to a minute silence at 11 o'clock. So if you're content, we can, we can just take a pause and adjourn for um, the next couple of minutes. Okay? okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Okay, members, um, thank you for that. We move on then to item seven. Moving on to item seven, um, SL1, the Trunk Road, T2 Balnehinch Bypass Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Page 81, you have the um, details of the order, and then at page 87, um, the department's briefing. And again, if I can call on Don to lead yeah, so this stage. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, we'll follow a similar pattern to the A1. Um, so Balnehinch Bypass, the previous minister announced a decision to proceed in December 2016 and asked officials to make the orders. Now, at that stage, the assembly uh, collapsed and so the orders weren't able to be made. So um, uh, the SL1 coming forward today uh, is to make the direction order for, for the scheme uh, linking it back to the notice to proceed back in 2016. So, um, Davy, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, and then Liam's got another short presentation. No, just always confirm, if members will recall, that the, the Assembly fell in January 2017, uh, and this direction order SL1 was in front of the, to be up in front of the committee, I think it was the third sitting in January 2017, but unfortunately the assembly fell. Um, in the uh, intervening time, the, uh, the assembly was down. Uh, 
feeling was that we couldn't make the direct in order in the absence of a minister. Uh, now the minister's in place and a certain amount of environmental information had to be updated and reviewed from the, the initial decision in 2016 to ensure there's been no changes. Um, and that is now being completed. We're now at the stage now that uh, the, the direct in order can be made for the scheme. Okay, so Liam's got a, another presentation on this, if you want to get it up on the screen. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, in terms of the A24, the A24 shown on the blue line on the map um, is the trunk road from Belfast uh, to Newcastle. Um, and at present, the A24 um, passes through the centre of Ballinahinch via the one-way circulatory system in the town centre. Uh, and within Ballinahinch, um, the A24 is used for by both strategic traffic, including commuters to and from Belfast, and local traffic um, to the town centre. Um, and at present, Ballinahinch forms a bottleneck for strategic traffic, and the objective of this scheme is to improve journey times and journey time reliability and safety on the A24 um, by providing a bypass of Valenhinch. So the scheme in itself is to provide um, a 3.1 kilometre long single carriageway bypass to the east of um, Valenhinch Town Centre. Um, the new bypass will connect to the existing road network to the north um, at the A20, via a, a, an at grade roundabout at the A21 St. Field Road Junction and to the south um, via an at grade roundabout at the B2 Downpatrick Road Junction. Um, the new bypass will also include overtaking opportunities um, via climbing lanes along um, the, the new bypass in the southbound direction from uh, the uh, St. Field Road roundabout and in a northbound direction from the Dumpatrick Road roundabout. Um, a new compact grade separated junction will be provided to link the Cross Gar Road to the new bypass. Um, and the scheme will also include a two and a half meter wide combined footway cycleway adjacent to the northbound carriageway on the west side of, of the new bypass. Um, it is also proposed that a, a new park and share site would be provided adjacent to the A21 St. Field Road roundabout and that um, park and share facility would accommodate 27 parking bays. Um, so essentially those are the main elements um, of Balanage Bypass. And, and maybe throw it back over to you, John. Yeah, I, I suppose maybe, David, you could come in. So, so there, there was a public inquiry on, on this in 2015, correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah, so so it was a public inquiry, uh, and then the minister at the time uh, announced the decision to proceed and asked the officials to make the orders. And essentially, now uh, we're here today to let you scrutinise the direction order. Uh, once that order, uh, if that order is is made, then uh, that completes the end of the development phase for this particular project. Um, so probably best to go to any questions. Um, thank you very much, John and and, um, and Liam and Davy. Um, obviously, I have, a, I have an interest in this falls in, within my constituency. So, um, of course, it, it is um, long overdue, and it's 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 good to see that the progress is finally being made um, in respect of that. I suppose the concern is the delay, and obviously, um, the fall of the assembly has not aided that. But 
I am suppose concerned that we're that we're over a year back, and this is only coming to us now. And, and I appreciate that um, the environmental um, assessments and so on have to be to be looked at again. But I suppose still mindful of the fact that that's taken o over a year to do. Um, were there any changes within within that that kind of justified that that work? Well. Maybe just to comment, yes, the, envir the environmental information uh, reports and updates uh, had to be reviewed, and that had to fit in with all the other work. Um, but what we have, what we have now, and what the legislation requires us to, have to be as a competent authority and have the competence to assess the environmental information and update reports being provided by our consultants, and we do that through the shared environment service, uh, shared environment service. Uh, who are an organisation who work for the local councils? So they provide us with the expertise, but they have they have a body of work as well. So we have to fit into their work program, and unfortunately, that that's just the length of time it took us to get the environmental information checked through them, and then we're ready to go now. Okay, and, and just with regards to, to um, reviewing um, environmental information, you know, if um, for, and we talked about the scheme um, uh, earlier with regards to the A1, and if there is a lapse in time, even with regards to that, may you then have to go out again for to update your environmental information before progressing, if there is a, a gap between this process yeah. and funding? Yeah, yeah. There's a, uh, environmental impact assessments for the schemes are live documents, so they're updated and reviewed at key decision points. So they're making a direction order, making the orders as a decision point. They will be reviewed and updated again to see if there's been any significant change uh, when we go to award the contract to the scheme and before, they, before any figures appear on the ground to make sure there has been no environmental changes, significant environmental changes, but that the needs to means we have to do something else require some other assessment. With each key decision point, the environmental information is updated to ensure there's been no changes. Okay, so that's, it's continually under review um, throughout yeah. that process. Okay, um, and um, Liam mentioned obviously the, the um, improvement in journey times. Can you give us an idea of an estimate, at, um, the estimate of benefit um, that this scheme will, will um, give to um, commuters? I, I, w I wouldn't have that that information to hand, particularly in, in terms of um, you know the, the average time saved. Um, but that information will be within our traffic assessment report, which was would have been tabled at the, the, the public inquiry back in 2015. But I can I can uh, extract that information for you. Okay. But obviously, we're well aware that at. at Significant times, the the delay to strategic traffic, um, uh, can be significant um, uh, through Balnehinch at, at peak periods. Um, but we, we can extract that information for you. Okay, thank you. And then um, just in relation to funding and obviously the cost of the scheme, and no doubt that the delay in commencing all of this will will perhaps have will not have helped the, the final figure, but um, John, can I maybe get a, an estimate of, um, of, of where we are with regards to that? So uh, the estimate, estimate of the scheme is 35 to 45 million. Uh, and again, uh, the, the delivery of the scheme is, will be subject to you know, ministerial priorities and, and future budget settlements. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I know it's known that I'm not a great fan of bypasses, but I'll give way to the Chair on this one, I think. Uh, due to town centre effect, economic declines potentially, and environmental reinstatements that take a while. But uh, moving on to questions, then, just the consultation was, as you say, six years ago, and then there was a public inquiry. There's been other consultations within this building and other departments, which after three or four years ran out, and they decided to rerun there. You had 36 responses, 23 objections. Is it because the public inquiry took place that you're satisfied to move on after six years without any further communications? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the public inquiry, the, the public inquiry um, 
assess all the uh, representations made by the landowners. The landowners haven't changed, and the landowners are aware of the outcome of the public inquiry. Um, I'm just talking about the timeline of six years, which is quite a time. Are you content that everyone's as it were, really? Yeah, it, 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 the, the circumstances are as it were, the assembly fell. Um, and we were unable to do that through the assembly. Uh, but the environmental information is key before we make any decision, e e decision points or any decision to make in schemes. We have to have it updated. And unfortunately, that's, it, that's the length of time it took us to get the environmental information updated to allow us to get to this point where we can now make the direction order. Yeah, no, I do share the chair's uh, concern in relation to it taking a year. Uh, on the combined footway cycle lanes, is that the best option? I uh, know there's been major roadworks in other areas and the, the combined scheme has caused a few problems. Is, is this the best way for this part of the road to be designated? So Liam, Liam maybe you can come in on the, the design of the scheme, but, but maybe just to add to that, uh, you, you know, so the Minister uh, recognises, you know, the, uh, she, she's committed to sustainable travel measures and you know, walking and cycling. So as part of this scheme, taking this scheme forward. She's asked us to look at complementary measures in, in the town centre, uh, that when you take traffic out of it, you can bring in sustainable measures and, and placemaking measures. So so that, that, that's something that uh, alongside the scheme will we'll deliver, uh, uh, we'll be looking at delivering different benefits. So uh, in relation to the actual walking and cycling on the scheme, Liam? Yeah, well, um, the, the design of the, the shared footway, cycleway uh, design, have, we have engaged with our active travel branch um, as part of, of, of the process of putting that in place. Um, there inevitably are constraints in terms of the, the, the width that we have available to us, particularly on this um, location at the grade separated um, uh, junction at um, Crossgar Road. So um, there, we have discussed with them in, in terms of those things. So the, the proposals that we have taken forward um, do align with um, their their objectives and, and meet those things. But I, I think there, in fairness, there, there probably is a, 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 maybe a desire to, where possible, um, widen that footway provision um, if uh, if land were available to do so, but there are pinch points which which constrain that to some degree. But as we work through the next sort of stages, we'll continue to um, seek opportunities where uh, you know advancements in shared footway and best practice in shared footway design could be implemented along the scheme. Yep, no, I understand that. And just working from experience in my own constituency on the A2, you know. But I do welcome those town centre improvements, which will complement that too. Very, very welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Boylan. Thanks, Chair. Just uh, problems getting uh, Thanks very much for the presentation again. Just. Um, now listen to once again, obviously it's the best Nord issue, the notice is making the best Nord will be made at a later date when the fund is available. What Jared brought the issue of the funding up. Um, does the Minister intend to fund the scheme this year? So, uh, can I take that? So, um, again, with any scheme like this, there, there's a lead-in before you can consume um, funding because you have to get through the statutory processes so uh, and then you have to procure and deliver it so it, it, it can't you know the, the the earliest delivery date uh, uh, you know after the orders are made uh, uh is probably you know 18 months to procure and then another 18 months to build so uh, uh, uh and the that, that timeline then depends on funding being available and, and against all of the other competing capital priorities that the Minister has and water, wastewater, transport, etc. No, no, I appreciate it, John. I know that this is a 35 to £45 million pound project and we £722 million pound capital. So my question would be, um, and I appreciate the 18-month time frame, but 
can can the minister can we get it? I mean, the minister could commit to this project in this financial year, could she not? So, so again, it's a bit like the A1. Once the orders are made and the development phase is finished, the minister, the minister can take, you know, consider her priorities going forward alongside everything else, and ultimately that's the decision, you know, for the minister. So no, that's that's okay. Now it's just it's the similar one to A1, but I mean, obviously, a lot of members or some of the members of the committee there would like to see this project too. So I have no problem in supporting that. But thanks very much for your presentations and your answers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Muir. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank you to um, John, Liam and Davy for the presentation and for coming today. Um, I think this project um, is uh, will be warmly welcomed, uh, not just by yourself, Chair, but by people um, living in the area and also those people coming to and from other towns, particularly Newcastle, um, during busy bank holidays, for example. Um, the congestion and the air pollution created as a result of the um, conge uh, congestion in the town is an issue. Um, it does mention a park and share facility. Is there any reason why it's a park and share rather than also a park and ride? And whether there be any discussions with TransLink about upgrading that to a park and ride facility? Um, John, if I can maybe take that. In terms of the, the development of the proposals, TransLink were engaged at that stage um, uh, whenever the, the proposals for that, for that facility was in place. And at that stage, um, TransLink did not express a, a desire to, to operate uh, a park and ride facility at that location. Um, my understanding is that TransLink's priority was their their bus stop facilities in the town centre, um, for those longer um, longer uh, distance journeys. Um, but yes, they were involved in the engagement process um, at that stage um, and, and didn't express a desire for this to be a park and ride site. Can I just, just add to that then? So uh, the Minister is very focused on, on delivery of park and ride. So whilst we have a park and share site in the plan here, <clears throat> I, I suppose you know, strategically uh, there could be further engagement with TransLink for some sort of a park and ride in the in the area. Uh, and the department has a park and ride program board that's trying to take a forward look at these things. So whilst it's not in the scheme, uh, it, it may, may come back in to play for discussions. Sure. Thanks very much. That's appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think that's all our questions. Um, you'll be relieved to know. Um, so thank you very much um, to John, Davy, and to, to Liam for your time this morning. It's very much appreciated. So okay. are members content with the proposals for the statutory rules? Good. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I we'll look forward to both of those projects being progressed. Here we are. Um, move then to our departmental briefing on living with water in Belfast. Um, tabled at page 95, we have the, the briefing paper, which obviously includes the public consultation responses um, for the project. And I will welcome um, an attending um, via Starleaf or Simon Richardson, the director of Living with Water program, and Stuart Whitman, the program manager. Um, you're both very welcome to committee this morning, and apologies for for the delay. Um, and also, I'm going to have to, to say that we have to leave this room by noon, um, so we're maybe a little bit under pressure for time. Um, but if I could pass over to, to Simon um, initially, and then um, we'll move forward with the presentation of you. Thank you. Okay, Chair, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to return to the committee to uh, give you an update on the public consultation on the Living with Water in Belfast. Consultation. Um, my name is Simon Richardson, and I'm the director of the Living with Water program. And with me is Stuart Whiteman, who's the, the program manager. Um, just you, you have uh, the briefing pack, and if you turn to page 99 in your briefing pack, that's the, the slide set that I want to address this, this morning. Chair, I do note that the time constraint, so I will move quickly through the presentation, and hopefully then we'll get a chance for for some questions at the end. So if you flick on to page 99, is just an introductory slide. Page 100, then, if we move to that, the Living with Water in Belfast document actually is the strategic drainage infrastructure plan for Belfast, and it promotes greener catchment-based solutions alongside hard engineered measures. 
and we launched a consultation on that document on the 11th of November last year. And Stuart and I were in front of the committee a week later on the 18th of November to give you an update on the plan. The consultation closed on the 29th of January this year, but we did accept some late responses. Um, uh, we emailed the consultation to 331 consultees, and during the consultation process, we carried out a social media update to remind people of the, um, of the consultation and to encourage them to respond. Now, in the lead up to and during the consultation, Stuart and I did 27 presentations to stakeholders uh, to highlight, the, to highlight the, the consultation document. And in total, we received 31 responses. And just before I move off that, that slide, just take you to the left hand side and remind you that the three key objectives for living with water are to uh, protect against flooding, enhance the environment, and grow the economy by trying to maximise the capacity within our wastewater infrastructure. So moving on to your pack on page 101, just an overview of the consultation responses. And I'll flick through this fairly quickly. Uh, responses received were overwhelmingly positive and welcomed the objectives and approach taken. Many welcomed the opportunity for integrated working and welcomed further engagement and suggested additional opportunities that we should consider. There were a number of points where respondents sought clarity, particularly around the blue-green proposals that are in the plan, and we will try to address those in our consultation uh, report. The plan asked eight specific questions, and I will I will pass uh, we'll go through those now with you. Just moving on to page one hundred two in your document. So, consultation question one: Do you agree that Belfast is facing significant drainage and wastewater management issues? Twenty-four of the thirty-one responded directly to this question, and twenty-three said yes. One respondent didn't answer yes or no, but made general made general comments. Now, because of the time, Minister, or, or Chair, sorry, I um, won't go through the, the bullet points to the right hand side, but it's there for members' information. So I'll jump down to our response at the bottom of that page. So the overwhelming consensus is that Belfast is facing significant drainage and wastewater management issues, and we welcome the clear support for the aims of the Living with Water programme. So again, moving on to question two, page 103. Do you agree that we need to change the way we manage water flowing through our urban areas? 24 res responses uh, directly to that question, and all answered yes. So there was unanimous support for this. Again, there are a number of bullet points there for your information. So our response was agreement that we need to change the way we manage water flowing through our urban areas. We welcome this, and we agree that it will be important to work closely with partners and local communities to implement the plan. And this communication and engagement with local communities is a theme running right through this, and you'll, you'll see this coming out in the presentation. Question three, do you agree that during periods of heavy rain, green spaces in urban areas should be used to hold water on a temporary basis? to help prevent the flooding of homes and businesses and help prevent sewage spilling into sewage <coughs> rivers and Belfast Lock. We felt this was a very important question because this is fundamental to what we're trying to do. We're trying to use green spaces to hold water at times of heavy rain. And again, 22 responses to this question all answered yes. I just want to take you to the, the final bullet point on the right. And again, early engagement was essential uh, to ensure the buy-in to, to, to this approach. So that's just I'll just highlight that point. And again, jumping down to our response, there's widespread support for the use of green space to hold water in urban areas. We feel that's very important. We acknowledge this, and we intend to include this as a fundamental part of the plan. On to page 105 in your briefing pack on question four, do you agree with the catchment-based approach to address drainage and wastewater management problems? Again, all 20 responses to that question answered yes. So jumping down to our response, so we acknowledge the recognition that this is the best practice approach to address drainage and wastewater management problems. The development of clear policy guidelines and early community engagement, again, is recognised as critical <coughs> to successfully implementing the plan. Moving on to page 106, this is just a, a refresher for you in relation to the school geographical scope of the plan. The plan was divided into four study areas, three land-based and one being Belfast Lock itself. So the next three questions, questions five, six, and seven, are, are focused on, on the study areas themselves um, to try and focus individuals on, on getting responses in their local area. So question five, do you agree that we have identified all the pressures and issues and set the correct objectives? Now, in this question, many respondents felt they didn't have enough detailed knowledge of the area to identify all the pressures and issues. So we had a small number of responses who answered this question. 
most of them identified the fact that we had identified all the pressures and issues, and some then suggested uh, additional pressures and issues. So jumping down to our response again, we've said here the majority agree that all of the pressures and issues have been identified and that the correct objectives for each study area have been set. We welcome the additional information in relation to the pressures and issues, and we will consider these when finalising the plan. Moving on then to page 108, in your brief impact, question six, do you agree that we've identified all of the opportunities uh, for integrated drainage measures? And these are opportunities to try and address the pressures and issues from the previous question. Again, similarly, a, a number of respondents said they didn't have enough local knowledge uh, to, to comment. So we had a small number of responses in that to this question. And again, if I jump down to our response to this, so the majority agreed that all opportunities for integrated drainage had been identified. We are encouraged by the willingness to engage on the proposals as the plan is further developed and implemented. And we will consider and assess the additional proposals received. So there was, there was a willingness from the people who didn't know the, the, the specific area, there was a willingness from them to, to, to engage going forward in the plan, which is, which is very encouraging. Question seven, do you agree that the proposed measures adequately address the pressures and issues and meet the objectives? This question was asking for a bit more detail. So the opportunities were the locations are, are likely to be the measures are more detailed uh, structures that we may use to attenuate water and blue-green infrastructure. And to be fair, we didn't get a lot of response to, to, to this question. And I think um, we need to recognize that. And, and in our response, I've said we are encouraged by the support for the proposed measures. Um, however, I think it highlights the fact that we need continued engagement on the blue-green proposals moving forward, um, both at a detail level and also at a community level. And then moving forward to page 110, which is the last question, question eight. Do you agree that the levels of investment identified within the plan are necessary and should be considered a high priority for the Northern Ireland Executive? 21 people responded directly to this question and all said yes. So just as a bit of a reminder, this is a 12-year plan um, and it's as an estimated cost of £1.4 billion. Pounds. Just on bullet point two there, there was widespread recognition that any delays would only cause further problems and the risks to grow. So I just want to highlight that point. And the, the final bullet point at the bottom was value placed on the blue-green infrastructure and widely recognised that the 200 million of that 1.4 billion was for blue-green. However, questions were asked whether this proportion was enough and whether a, a greater element should be um, put towards blue-green measures. So again, in our response to this, we welcome the responses uh, and the considerable support for the fully funded programme and prioritisation of the plan. So moving on then to page uh, 111. Um, th th those are some of the key themes raised in the general responses. And due, due to the time constraints, Chair, I'll not, I'll not read through those, just want to touch on a couple. Second one down on the left-hand side, natural flood management and need for financial incentives. That's for upper catchment management and private landowners, farm, farmers, whose land may be very useful to us to attenuate water, how do we incentivize those landowners to allow their land to be flooded, to slow down the flow of water through the catchment? And that, that's something that we're gonna to have to work through within the plan. The third point down on the left-hand side, again, is back to our stakeholder consultation or engagement. And that's gonna be a huge part of what we do when we get into the delivery elements of, of the plan. Um, and over to the right-hand side, clarity and details of funding for blue-green infrastructure. Uh, that goes back to question seven, and I think we have to recognise that we have to do more work in bringing forward those schemes for appraisal and development, and then sharing those schemes with with the community groups on the local area. And then the final bullet point on the right, hand, uh, the final box at the right hand side is obviously the need for long term funding, and the phasing of the plan. Sure. Moving on to page one twelve, and and, and, and um, the, my last slide here is just the next steps. We're at the, Presently uh, developing a consultation report based on the consultation responses we've received and we will be publishing that on our website. Obviously we're here today to brief the committee on the responses that we've received. We then need to develop the final plan so we're taking the consultation document and making necessary amendments to that and we will be reviewing the investment profile which will, inter which will be informed by the utility regulators final determination in PC21 so that, that comes out I think on the 13th of May. So we will need to consider that, and that will feed into the final development of the plan. We will also need new governance arrangements to move basically into the delivery phase. We're moving from development of the plan into delivery of the plan, and that's 
you know, that's a significant change for us. So we need to be have the proper governance in place to allow that that change. And then finally, the last bullet point, uh, the final plan, and then will be taken to the minister for her approval. And subject to that, then she will take the final plan to her executive colleagues. Sure, that's a very, very quick run through. And apologies if I've done that too quickly, but hopefully um, it gives you a feel for the responses and you know, we're happy to take questions. Okay, no, thank you very much um, for your presentation, Simon. And you, you had indicated that you had met with 27 stakeholders, and obviously that's in addition to then the 31 responses that you received. Um, can I just ask, um, was there anything within those events or within the responses that challenged you and, and, and challenged um, the position um, within the paper that made you think perhaps we may not want to look at this again or aspects of it again? No, I, th I think, I think the, the approach was widely recognised as being the right approach. Um, the way we are trying to identify, the, you know, we've, we've set this out, we're trying to identify the pressures and issues, basically the problems that there are in, 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 in various parts of the plan area. Then we're looking at opportunities to try and slow the water down coming down through the catchment. And then we're looking at the detailed schemes that we can do to, to, with those opportunities. So I think that approach in itself was widely recognised. Um, there were there were some localised concerns about the impact that it may have on, on, on certain, uh, for instance, some certain parks in certain areas, whether football pitches may be lost or, or things, so some localised issues like that. But generally, what we were saying, look, we're not here to to trample over other other objectives from other other, or, other organisations. For instance, we want to work closely with, with councils and other big landowners like the housing executives. So if we, if we had identified a a location, an opportunity, a green space that may well be a housing executive land, and the housing executive had other plans for that. But we, you know, we would try and incorporate our work with that. So I think it was it was um, more of a feedback coming back to make sure that we weren't imposing this on people, but that we were integrating it with other key infrastructure works. Um, so I think that's that's where the that, that's where the comments came back. But there was no indication that we we're going down the wrong road here. Okay, so it was, it was largely positive, although I noticed from a, a number of the questions that um, respondents weren't able really to comment specifically, mm -hmm. and that was perhaps because it was outside of, um, I suppose, that maybe their, their areas of expertise or so on as well. Um, are, you, are you content broadly then with, with the, the number of responses and the, the quality of the responses that came through? <clears throat> Yeah, the 31 responses in total we were very happy with. Um, most of those responses are significant responses coming from the councils and, and other bodies. Um, the, the questions five, six and seven, we, we did think long and hard about those questions and we wanted to give locals and anybody who knows the area the opportunity to to drill down and, and come back with opportunities for us to look at again in case we had missed something because if we had missed something you know this would have been a positive interaction if, if people brought new opportunities to us and, and they have done that so that that was the reason for those specific questions and, and and we did we did understand that we were going to get fewer responses to those i think the 31 responses were significant and again we recognize the questions five six and seven um had, had lower returns but, but I think uh, I think that was expected, but it also highlights the fact that we then need, we, there's work to be done in relation to that community engagement, explaining what we want to do and trying to get people's detailed responses on what their ideas may be. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Anderson? Uh, thank you, Chair. I couldn't get myself unmuted there. Um, thank you for, for the presentation and the information you received um, previously. At the previous meeting, we discussed the A2 Bunk Cranor Road project in Derry, and you said it had ticked all the boxes for the Living With Water and uh, allowed you to look at the opportunity uh, right through the catchment uh, along the A2 Road. Now, my understanding is that uh, Department uh, for Infrastructural Officials are currently exploring uh, the, the proposal just to extend the Gallia Linear Park into the Living with Water program to construct a, a sustainable drainage system because that's going to be necessary for the A2. Could you elaborate on any of that for me, please? Yes, indeed. 
Um, since we last met in, in November last week, we have, at that stage, we were starting off that process of working with uh, our colleagues in the road scheme. And the minister has given us approval to take forward uh, uh, an, an extended a drainage scheme within the area, so that would complement not only complement the road drainage, the drainage that is acquired for the road, but also, as you say, then expand that out into integrated drainage schemes in the Galley Linear Park, and not only just Galley Linear Park, but the wider area around the A2 Bunkrana Road. Um, and, and we've made significant progress in doing that. We've been able to uh, work closely with the road scheme and try and identify their needs, expand that out into the. Um, uh, opportunities again that are there for us. Mm -hmm. We have shared those opportunities with other key players, the uh, Department for Communities and the Housing Executive, the, the, the Council, to see how we can integrate our, now that our proposals are coming to a point where, where we know what we could do and what is beneficial, we want to tie up and make sure that our proposals can integrate with other investment bodies in the area to make sure that it's that, that, that they're really integrated schemes. So I, I will re repeat what I said before, the, the A2 from Cranor, the dairy scheme ticks all the boxes for us living with water is concerned and we're really keen to progress it and we're delighted that the minister has, minister has supported that to allow us to, to extend that um, investigation. So that's that's coming to an end, I'm sorry, coming to a conclusion and that a report will come out of that. So. We'll, the minister will be sharing that in, in the not too distant future. Oh, that, that's great news! Great news for Derry, and I think what you're saying about making sure it's integrated because the the whole area around the the Moss Park Master Plan. You know, you talked about housing, you talked about the department for communities, and that's what we want all of the officials working together collaboratively on this particular project. Now, my understanding, maybe you could elaborate if you can, is that. You're also you might be keen to extend it to to a dairy city wide living with water and uh, type approach rather than just that particular area around the A2. Is that being considered? It, it is being considered, and as part of the report, we are focusing on the A2 Bunkrana Road area for this report. But we are asking the, the, the our partners that we're working with to consider the possibility of extending that out into a dairy. A strategic drainage infrastructure plan in a similar way to, to the, the Belfast plan that we're looking at today. Um, and the lessons that we've learned from the Belfast plan, I'm hoping that we can that we can take those lessons learned and actually develop a strategic drainage infrastructure plan for dairy in a quicker, you know, to, br to bring the process forward. But yes, our ultimate aim was to do a strategic drainage infrastructure plan for dairy. And because, because, the road, because of the road scheme and the opportunities that has brought to us, We've, we've gone down that road much quicker than we probably thought we would, so which is a really, really good thing. But again, we have to integrate that with, with, with other work in the area. But yes, there are uh, we are considering and, and we will bring forward proposals for a dairy strategic drainage infrastructure plan at the end of this, at the end of our work on, on the uh, Tube and Cranor Road. Okay, I look forward to uh, to receiving information on that and obviously working with you, particularly around the Tube and Cranor Road. Thank you, Chair. That's good news for us to hear that in dairy play. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hildage, Deputy Chair. Thanks, Chair and Gentlemen. You're, you're very welcome. I look forward to the project coming to conclusion in the summer. Uh, just on the communications, and you indicate that social media updates were issued via Twitter throughout the consultation period. Did, did, did you get much response through the social media via Twitter in relation to responses? And, no? Um, well, our, our, all of our all of the thirty one substantive thirty one responses came through the the requested um, channels either by email or directly through our website. Right. Um, I, I would need to check with our press office to see how many people responded to to the the um, the, the, the Twitter feed. But certainly in the twenty seven presentations that Stuart and I did, um, the organisations that we spoke to had, had had made comment to the fact that they had seen the uh, the, the, the Twitter campaign. Or, Going out, and that they welcome that to to, to, re, to keep to maintain an interest in the in the document. And I think you know, you know for you know, okay, we're we're heavily involved in this and, and, and looking at the plan, and it can be fairly dry. Pardon the pun, it's a draining thing, but it can be a very dry document to read. Um, uh, so we we wanted to maintain an interest in that. So I, I don't have I don't have any information as to who responded directly by Twitter. But I could I could seek that information from Simon. Simon, I'm not sure, Stuart here. I'm not sure anybody responded directly by Twitter. I think 
the Twitter campaign uh, basically pointed them, pointed them to, the, yeah. no, to, to, to the website yeah. and to yeah. the other channels. So it was more a prompt, really, yeah. for, for people. Would it have been useful, considering was it five, six, and seven received very limited responses because it was a bit of more localised issues? Would it have been would it have been good not to put that onto the likes of Facebook as well, where there are some fantastic localised groups within the communities? Uh, to give them that prompt as well, who maybe not be who fair use Twitter. I think Twitter is a certain clientele. Yeah, I mean, po possibly. I mean, that's a very constructive suggestion. Um, I think the difficulty for us is if, if you, the document is 150 pages long. It's it's, it's quite a meaty document, and, and to get. But just as a pointer, of course. Just yeah, as a yeah, pointer. Yeah. Yes, it may well. Yes, as a pointer to point people to the document. Yes, I mean that's a fair point, and obviously with the the local engagement that we're going to have to have going forward over this twelve year plan, we do intend to use social media on a more widespread basis to to get that feedback. But yes, it's a fair point. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, Simon and Stuart. My question, just one question, relates to question three. Your question three, regarding the green spaces. What opportunities are there in Belfast for that? You know, generally, and more. You referred earlier in a question to the chair. You know, up in the hills in regard to farmland, etc. So, what sort of opportunities are there? And have you looked at those? You know, is there is there many opportunities to, to flood green spaces and then obviously let that control water back in again? Yes, it's an excellent question. It's actually the, the first question I asked when I came into this this role. You know, do we are the opportunities there to make a significant difference to the, the quantities of water flowing down through our catchments? And, and and the answer to that is yes. I mean, we, we've we've a number we've identified a huge number of opportunities within the plan. Um, one example would be the Ballystone playing fields. Um, work that the Executive Office and Belfast City Council are doing to upgrade those playing fields. We've got involved in that. Um, project, so we're, we're trying to integrate blue infrastructure to attenuate water to to, to protect the, the, the downstream uh, flooding issues. So there, you know, there are a significant number of opportunities for us to work within the within the hills around Belfast and also the middle catchment where Ballysilm would fall into to work with councils and housing executive and areas where green spaces can be used. So yes, there, and that's where this document is. It's a high-level document. It's identified the opportunities of where we can go into to, to possibly do blue-green infrastructure. Um, and if, if we can get that integrated approach and that buy-in from the other uh, organisations, then we can integrate our work with theirs to deliver these benefits. So it's, it's a very valid point, yes. But, it's, but it, it, take, it will take a significant amount of blue infrastructure to deliver the quantities that we need. Yes. So, so, so Simon, how is that going to work? Pick Bally cell and I wouldn't be near I know well, but anyway, how, how is that actually going to work on the ground with the organisation that run that West, the council, or let's say it's a private field or whatever it is, how is that going to work in, in day to day? And at what point does it be flooded? Obviously, it's going to be heavy, heavy rain, I presume, but what, what are the, how are they going to be compensated for that, offering that facility up? Because obviously that wipes that facility out for a period of time and indeed then until it dries up again. Simon, do you want me to take the Ballycillen? Yes, please. Sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of Ballycillen, the the, the, the the current proposal is really there's a number of of, of water courses, rivers in the area, and one of the you know what the proposal is is actually daylighting, opening up some of those culverts through the park, and letting basically restoring a bit of the, what would have been the river's floodplain yeah. locally through the park, and really what really what the benefits are is that we're, we're you're, you're basically restricting. Whenever you get a heavy rainfall and you get the surge coming down, surge of water coming down the rivers, what you're basically doing is restricting the amount of water that 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 that, that basically flows on down the coverted river network uh, in Belfast. And by doing that, you're you're basically storing the water up in the park, which is reducing the the level of flood risk downstream. Now, in terms of, I'm not sure if any if if you're familiar with the Conswater Greenway, it would be similar to that, but on a smaller scale, where you would effectively have a sort of a, a, a the river channel with with a with sort of a wetland area either side of it, which would be sort of semi permanent as far as the park's concerned, but it would be it's probably similar arrangements to the to the you know to to the Conswater Greenway where you know there there'll be some hard infrastructure that would probably have to be maintained and um, by the department, but the rest of it would probably be, you know fall into the sort of the, the the general maintenance of the park, but some of that detail has still to be worked through. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Muir. 
Um, thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank you for the presentation and for it uh, in relation to what is a very important um, scheme. Just two issues. Um, obviously, the department has got additional capital spending for this financial year, um, but the resource is largely flat. And it's just your perspective. Do you have confidence you'll be able to deliver upon the capital fund that has been allocated for this year? Um, around that, and also in terms of funding this on an ongoing basis beyond this current financial year, what consideration has there been to using developer contributions to be able to address this much needed funding need? Okay, thank you for that. Um, certainly, in relation, I know the minister was with you last week, and we talked about the the, the, the split between capital and resource. You know, the capital heavy and, and, and the resource needed to to deliver the capital schemes. And we're in exactly the same position uh, moving forward with living with water. This year, um, I think it's fair to say, our, this will be the first year of a twelve year program. Uh, so the, the the funding program profile for the capital is is fairly low in the first year. So relatively speaking, at, at this point, uh, we probably do have the resource. Uh, to, to, to deliver what we need to deliver in the first year. But the, res the resource requirement moving forward into the middle years where we have significant investment, that that will be an issue that we have to address going forward. Um, uh, so it, 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 it is something that um, you know, we, will need to, we will need to address. Sorry, and I just switched out the second, second point, sorry, again. Developer contributions and what consideration? Sorry, yes. Yeah. Um, the developer contributions, what we're trying to do here with with living with water program is is retrofit the existing um, water courses and the catchment that is there. Developer contributions may well for, for for new developments. Developer contributions may well be something that could be considered um, uh, in the future. However, I'm not sure Stuart may want to come in here. I know from my roads background. Um, that we would have taken developer contributions in relation to developments going forward, and, and there was the, the legislative uh, vehicle to do that. I'm not so sure that NI Water has the or ourselves have the legislative vehicle to take developer contributions for drainage schemes and blue green infrastructure schemes. So that that would be that's a that's a fair point, and it, it aligns closely with what we do on the roadside. I'm just not sure that we have the the, the powers to actually. Ask developers to fund something uh, for drainage and, waste, and uh, wastewater infrastructure. Stuart, I'm not sure if you've any further details. Uh, on no, that. Simon, you're correct. There was actually a piece of work done um, last year. There was a, a, a financing group set up to look at the whole funding of Living with Water, and it went through a whole raft of different types and looked at the governance and the various models that other water companies have, and all the. So it revisited all that, and really, it concluded. You know, if you're, you know, whilst Northern Ireland Water continues to get most of its funding from, from, you know, from from government, um, it it will be, you know, the money will have to come from you know, unless you had, you know, charges. It was basically saying it would have to come in the form of grant developer contributions. My understanding was looked at as part of that piece of work. But you know, Simon's right. The there there are issues. Um, Northern Ireland Water don't have the same um, legislation and powers that the likes of the department has in terms of roads and. And yes, most of the stuff that we're doing, or, um, or, or all of it, should I say, in, in this plan is, as Simon said, fixing problems that are already there in terms of the existing infrastructure. But it's a very important point you make. We've got to make sure that the problem doesn't get worse with, with, with new developments. And that's possibly down the line where there would be a role for developer contributions and looking at the likes of sustainable drainage systems and things like that. So it's certainly something you know, that needs to be considered as part of the new, you know, new, new development proposals. But for, for, for the one point two billion pounds or one point four billion pounds, um, I'm not sure developer contributions would be would be would be applicable. Yeah, I think it's Simon out loud. It has been something in relation to roads. From my recollection, uh, stuff in relation to the body care relief road and stuff like that. There's an issue around developer contributions associated with that. But it's something I think we need to further explore, as you said, about ensuring we have capacity going forward, uh, because a lot of this has been. Uh, it's setting on the taxpayer, uh, whereby these developments actually should be paying their fair share. So I think it's something that needs to be actually considered going forward. Mm -hmm. but I appreciate your answers today. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And we have three further members have indicated, and I am mindful of approaching um, 12 o'clock. So, Mr. Boylan, first of all. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, Chair, can you hear me all right? We can. Yeah, thanks. Simon, you're welcome back. Thanks very much for your presentations. And you'd be glad with the discussions early on about the A1 and it's making progress. But saying just in terms of consultation, there were calls for incentives to encourage landowners to undertake environmentally friendly land improvements and also calls for innovative funding and implementation opportunities. So did the responses mention any specific ways how to do this and is the department exploring any opportunities in, in trying to develop that? Okay, yeah, yes, I, I listened to the interest of the A1 discussion earlier, so that was very a scheme that I was involved with previously. In, in relation to this and the incentives for, for landowners, th th this is something we, we particularly around Belfast, you know, in the, in the, in the Belfast Hills, the National Trust and uh, have a lot of land in the Belfast Hills which, which we could use. But there is a swathe of land between the upper catchment and down and come down into the lower catchment where you've got private land. And we need to look at ways, if, if we identify locations which will be a significant uh, benefit to us, I, it's not just a case of any land will do it. It needs to be at a location which it will provide the benefit that it will need. So if, if we can identify those locations which are significant and will provide significant benefits, um, then we need to sit down with those private landowners uh, to take forward uh, and develop a scheme that will compensate them for the loss of their land during periods of heavy rainfall. Now, the, the detail of those schemes has not yet been developed, and that's part of the, the, one of the, the policy and the legislative issues as part of this programme to be taken forward. And we're working with our colleagues in Water and Drainage Policy Division within the department to bring forward to, to, to bring forward things like that. And that's something Stuart has worked on possibly in the past and may have some further information if you want to add to that, Stuart. Yes, no, Simon, it's very much, yes, the, the, the detailed policy has to be worked through, but there are some issues around the powers and legislation and the various and what we can and cannot do, whether that's under the drainage order, the 73 drainage order, or the 2006 Water and Sewage Services order from North Island Water's point of view. So at the, at the, at the present, at, uh, we're, we're working with our colleagues in Water and Drainage Policy to scope out what possible primary legislation would be needed, and that would obviously, obviously that's going to take a bit of time, but that would be the next mandate, but there may be a consultation later in the year. Uh, you know, to, uh, on 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 those issues. Um, at this point in time, just to be clear, like it, it doesn't stop us by agreement. You know, working with the likes of the, the publicly owned landowners, the likes of the council, and also trust. It's only when you come across the private landowners that you know you 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 would need to. Uh, there, there, it may be limited to what we can do. It would have to be done by agreement um, and, until such times as we have the barriers and the powers. Okay, just just go back to the, the chair's point, and I'll put it a different way. Was you know the responses were generally supportive, but was there any construct, uh, constructive criticism feedback that you can take on board, Sam? Um, Stuart, do you want to you? I I'm not aware. Of, I'm not aware. Of, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that it was sort of linked to to what the chair said earlier about our. Our sessions that we had, Simon, with the various stakeholders, and one of the things that was in the draft plan was a capacity constraints map of Belfast. And obviously, that map has actually since changed. It's, unfortunately, it's all red now, as far as the sewers and, 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 and what have you are concerned. And one of the issues was that, um, you know, that particularly Belfast City Council and the other councils were keen to explore. When you say that there's no capacity, is there any way the development can proceed? You know, is there is there special conditions? So that's. That's certainly something that our colleagues in NI Water are looking at to see whether the, the development could proceed, for example, but the occupancy you know, doesn't happen until the infrastructure is in place or you, you phase the development. So it may well be that there might be a negative response initially from NI Water, but then they could speak, you know, the developers could speak. So um, the final plan will reflect that it would, and, and maybe might, might be a bit, bit less negative in terms of saying that, look, Although these areas are, are currently awaiting um, capacity increases, and um, what we're saying is there may be ways and in, in certain certain locations or scenarios where development can proceed, provided it, it meets certain conditions. So that's probably the biggest change that I can think of, Simon. That probably yeah. came out. Just just to come back to that, I, I don't like when, when you ask that question. I, I don't like saying no. There, there was no there was no kickback to us, and I don't like saying that. I wouldn't be naive enough to say that. Um, but generally, I think one of the things that I did pick up and I've tried to highlight it in the presentation is 
the, the constant re reference to community engagement mm -hmm. and, and working with the community and making sure we bring those board. I, I don't think it was a, I don't think it was a criticism of us because we're not at that point yet, but it, it was a reminder to us that that has to be a significant part of what we do. So, Mr. Boyle, I would take that as being our, 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 our key takeout from the from from those presentations that we did. Yeah. Sorry, just my final point, Chair. The presentation also states there was a recognised need for further information and policy guidance on the blue-green measures, including SUDS, ownership and maintenance. And Simon, is that something you're working on now in relation to get the policy out on that? And also, just finally, you mentioned the issue of housing exam. And I know clearly, in answer to Mr Muir's question, we have the issue now with social housing in the future. Um, he was talking about con developer contributions. So in, in terms of your conversations in relation to new build, in terms of social housing, have you factored that in as well, or is, is that not on the radar? Okay, and, well, in relation to SUDS, again, we're working with our colleagues in Water and Drainage Policy Division who are bringing forward uh, legislation to, to, to bring forward the SUDS element of it. So we're working on that, the policy element for SUDS and the legislative issue and, and the maintenance responsibility and things like that. So we are working actively with our Water and Drainage Policy uh, contact, our colleagues. In relation to Housing Executive, um, we recognise the housing side of being a, a partner that we need to work with because they've got huge areas of land that we could use. But we we will we we won't be saying to them, look, we will not be an obstacle to housing development. We we see us as being a key element of, of being able to allow this social housing to develop, because there is, as Stuart mentioned, there's a capacity constraints map, and at the currently the NI water could be providing negative responses. We want to use the green element and the green and blue infrastructure to free up the capacity to allow positive responses to housing developments, whether they be social or whatever they may be. So we see our interaction with housing executive not as being an obstacle to them, but certainly being a, 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 a benefit to them in, in helping them develop their, their schemes. So we want to integrate our blue schemes with, with any housing schemes that they may have. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Chair. Okay, unfortunately we have run out of time, um, but if you're content, and apologies to um, Ms. Kimmins and Mr. Beggs, um, but Simon and Stuart, if you're content that I'll ask members to, um, to forward their questions through to the clerk and um, we can send them on to you for, for response if you're happy enough to do that. Absolutely, Minister, yes. Yeah. Sure, absolutely, Joe, that's fine, yes. Sorry. That's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was a long time ago. Okay, um, okay thank you very, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, moving on then to um, our forward work programme. Uh, just draw your attention to that at page 114 if members are content. Um, next week we'll be receiving a briefing from Nilgan. So listen, if you remember, that was one which was delayed from a couple of weeks ago with regards to EU successor funding. And then we'll have a briefing from the Construction Employers Federation with regards to the review of the Planning Act. So if members are content um, with the programme as you see it. Okay, moving then to any other business. Anyone, anything you wish to raise at this stage? Nope. Okay, thank you very much. If members are content, um, our next meeting will be next Wednesday uh, in the Senate Chamber at 10 a.m. Um, and just advise those who are in the room just to socially distance, etc. as you leave. Um, if members are content, we will adjourn. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern